Welcome to our webinar um, on to bear or not to bear. That is the question. Uh, this is in reference to the uh, bridge enhanced ACL restoration or bear um, compared to a traditional ACL reconstruction surgery. I'd like to introduce this man right here, the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Mark Petropoli, um, graduated from Syracuse University, uh, as well as SUNY Upstate uh, valedictorian, after which time he went on to do his fellowships with world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. James Andrews. Um, since that time, he's about 24 years of experience, um, always looking to be on the cutting edge of surgical options, non-surgical options, regenerative type medicines, et cetera. And he's also the developer of knee repair, not knee replacement, uh, trademark since 2021. Myself, my name is Carl Calabrese. Uh, I'm a board uh, certified orthopedic specialist. Uh, I've been practicing about 10 years now, been in the role of leadership of director of rehab since uh, 2017, um, and then the operations uh, director since uh, 2023. So what is Victory Sports Medicine? Um, after his fellowship with Dr. Andrews, Dr. Pet P um, wanted to take what he learned um, his time with Dr. Andrews and create a comprehensive integrated practice of his own. Uh, Dr. P started uh, Victory Sports Medicine in 1999 with the goal of serving Central New York with the cutting edge, high quality care to athletes and non-athletes alike. Since uh, 1999, we've added uh, bare procedure, obviously, um, open MRI, ultrasound, digital x-ray, physical therapy, athletic training, V-fitness, um, fall prevention programs, MLS laser, BMAC or bone marrow aspirate concentrate, PRP, um, as well as uh, throwing slash running evaluations, as well as sports specific um, biomechanical evaluations. We do offer 24 hour sports guarantee. If you get injured, uh, call our office within 24 hours um, and we will get you in. That is if you can get here from in 24 hours as uh, we have patients as far as Belgium and done consoles with people as far as Australia um, at this point. So I'll hand it off to Dr. P and then we'll go from there. All right. Thanks, Carl. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, yes, it does say Lori Delgado up there. If you're looking at uh, our faces, uh, Lori is uh, taking questions. Um, so she'll be getting us the answer, uh, some questions that we'll answer at the end. She's our um, director of finance. Uh, she she does it all. Uh, she controls Carl and I. Without her, we wouldn't be who we are. So anyway, uh, normally, if you've seen, uh, Carl and I have done at least two other webinars um, on the bear since we started uh, doing this procedure. And normally, we kind of go right into the science and, you know, what the problem was and how the bear uh, de was developed and all that stuff. But now that we have a lot of experience and we've done a lot of these surgeries and rehabbed a lot of these patients... Uh, we figured we'd start out uh, with a with a story. And so Izzy's story is that Izzy is the first patient that uh, we performed the bear uh, procedure on and rehabbed and got her back to sports. Um, she was the first uh, uh, bear procedure done outside the clinical trials uh, that was uh, uh, in an FDA uh, indicated uh, indication. So anyway, she injured her right knee in a high school field hockey game uh, in September of 2021. It was a non-contact cutting injury. Uh, that, that could be a whole nother talk. Um, we know that females are five to 10 times more common, likely to tear their ACL than males and non-cutting injuries are by, by far more common than, um, than contact injuries or non-contact injuries, I should say, are more con common than contact injuries um, and usually a cutting mechanism. So that's how she tore it, not uncommon. Um, her x-rays were negative for fracture. That's also not uncommon. She did have an MRI um, and that was uh, about four days later and that showed her ACL was torn and she probably had medial and lateral meniscus tears. So as I alluded to, uh, we performed the first uh, on-label FDA bear surgery outside of the Boston Children's Hospital uh, clinical trials, and uh, her surgery was done on 10-29-21. The surgery was right knee arthroscopy, anterior cruciate ligament repair with the bridge enhanced ACL restoration implant. So that's where bear comes from. Um, and we also repaired her medial and lateral meniscus. Um, I'll show some video of a procedure um, in a minute here. Actually, I'll show it right now. So we'll, we'll, we'll show this right here. Some of it's self-explanatory. Um, and again, we have a lot more experience with this now. So we, on those other webinars, we didn't have a lot of this stuff, but so here's a, 
little uh, snippet on what the bear surgery is like. Dr. Petropoli here. We're going to talk about the bear ACL repair restoration procedure. First, we put the scope in. We're going to look around throughout the entire joint, look at the articular cartilage, see if the ACL is torn, if it has a large enough stump on the tibia in order to perform the surgery, which usually needs to be at least a centimeter. Look throughout the whole joint, make sure there's no other pathology. In this case, there's a lateral meniscus tear. We're going to repair it with a nice vertical mattress. We're going to put two sutures in it. And what we found is this bear implant not only helps the ACL grow back, but we're finding that we think it helps the meniscus repairs heal much nicer. So that came together real nice. Then cleaning up the joint so that we can see the full extent of the ACL tear. There is a stump on the tibia. It's over a centimeter. We're going to do a notch plasty, which means widen the area, the notch where the ACL is. That's going to help prevent any pinching, but also it's going to expose some bone, which is going to release some bone marrow elements, which have stem cells in it, which will help with the healing. This is putting the stump, that's the stump right there, stump suture through, and we're going to crisscross this through. We have really excellent tools in order to do this nowadays to suture and put the stitch through. We're going to crisscross that through uh, multiple times from two different directions to get that stump secure so that we can eventually pull that up into the implant. Now we're drilling the femoral tunnel from the lateral side, the outside in, which I found uh, is a lot easier than drilling from the inside out. We can make a much smaller incision laterally there. We're gonna take an endo button. It's gonna go laterally on the lateral femoral cortex. It has the two ethabond synth sutures through it. And we're gonna put the stump sutures in the opposite direction of the cinch sutures going to pull those through the femoral tunnel out through the antremedial portal site and place that endo button right on the lateral femoral cortex, pull it down. Next, we're going to drill the tibial tunnel. That ends up being a bullseye right there. We make a much smaller tunnel, only about 2.8 millimeters. Once we get the arthrotomy made, we're going to take those cinch sutures through the arthrotomy, and then there's two sutures, four ends. We're gonna place one end through one quadrant, another end through the other quadrant, and then the other two through the other two quadrants. So we have four suture ends going through four quadrants on the bare implant, which you see there. It looks awfully large, but we're gonna hydrate that with blood and that's gonna actually soak the blood up and it's gonna be pliable and be able to push it in the joint. We're gonna take the cinch sutures and pull them through the tibial tunnel because they're gonna go all the way from the lateral femoral cortex through the interior of the joint. And they are gonna come out the tibial tunnel. They're gonna be kind of like an internal brace. We're gonna put an endo button on the tibial sutures. So there's four holes in the endo button. Those four sutures go through that. We wanna make sure that the arthrotomy is large enough to get a finger in so that we can push the implant in over a tight rope, which those cinch sutures are. We're going to hydrate the implant and leave it al dente, I like to say, so that it's not too soft and be able to push it in as one nice implant going into the joint in between the two ends of the ACL. We're going to suture it up, put the brace on. Thank you very much. Okay. That music is actually playing in the OR every single time. No, I was just going to say, Lori picked, Lori picked that music, and Carl was just about ready to get up and dance here. So, uh, yeah, no, it's good music. We, I usually play classic rock, but yeah, it, it, it works. So anyway, this is amazing here. If you look to the left where that arrow is, and you might see my cursor here, there's the stump of the ACL. Uh, ligaments should be black. Tendons are black. This is the patellar tendon. So this is the femur, the thigh bone. This is the patella, the kneecap, this is the tibia, the shin bone, and this is looking at it kind of from the side. An MRI slices through the knee electronically like a cold cut slicer. So you have a stump here, and you need to have at least a stump of a centimeter in order to put those stump sutures in, as you saw from the video, to pull that um, stump up into where the implant goes. So this is six months later, and you can see that that ligament is all the way reattached here to the femur, the thigh bone, whereas back here, it was just a globby mess. So that stump got pulled up into here. The implant got sewn in between. And there's your 
there's your uh, healed, uh, regrown ACL. Amazing. And so uh, right around 11 months, 10 months, three days after her surgery, um, she had been working with Carl uh, and the rehab team here all along. Um, uh, there's Carl will go through all these things, but there's certain um, milestones that we want people to to uh, get to in order to be able to return the sport. Uh, she passed all of those um, tests um, greater than 95%, and she was cleared for a gradual return to sport and competition. We usually don't start them uh, from zero to 60 so immediately. Passed. So this is kind of what it's all about here. All of your tests, uh, well above 95%. So, we're going to clear you to play. <laughs> there it is. Okay. <laughs> so, she's ecstatic. She was going to... So you passed be, Carl wants to show that again. <laughs> because it was so... It was it was great. It was great. Um, again, remember, she was cleared for gradual return. So, eight days later, uh, we see... I see an Instagram post. And there's the picture from the Instagram post. And it says, player of the game. Uh, so she played in her first game. She gradually played 60 minutes. She played the entire time. Um, so it wasn't quite exactly uh, what, the, you know, the gradual return that we wanted. Um, but thankfully, she did extremely well. She completed her first year uh, successfully. Um, you can see she has a brace on. Um, we usually will have them wear that brace for the first year. Uh, technically, if she doesn't want to wear it next year, she doesn't have to. So we'll see how that goes, but she did great. And her one year post-op MRI, this one's a little bit more grainy, but again, you can see those fibers coming all the way from the tibia attached and all the way up on the femur. We usually MRI them at nine months and 12 months and then two years. Um, nine months, because that's getting relatively close to clearance time a year, because that's kind of a, um, the, a milestone. Um, and especially for research, which which we're doing on these, and then two years similarly for more for research. So this bear stands for bridge enhanced ACL restoration. You know what's the difference? What's what's so what's the big deal about this implant right here? This thing that's in my hand looks like a packing peanut. Well, um, when the ACL tears, it, it, it's like a rope, and when a rope when a rope tears, it's kind of like the ends are all all shredded and inside the knee there's fluid so it just flops around and it never is able to meld back together and so when an acl tears especially a complete tear it's not going to heal on its own so people have known this all the way back to ancient greek times um, and you would think okay if something tears let's sew it together and get it to heal so even going back then which i don't know how they did it with bones or something like that and sinew but they tried to sew these things back together again and um they uh they, it didn't really work very well. Two reasons. One, very difficult to do, suture. The other, um, because our joint has fluid in it. And even if you can suture the thing back together, that blood that would normally form in between the two ends of the torn ligament, um, they'll, that, they'll, that scab that allows the ligament cells and um, blood vessels and nerves to grow across, it's going to wash away and your joint doesn't like blood inside of it. So not only is it, is it going to kind of wash away just in the fluid, but your joint doesn't like blood because it's inflammatory. So it's going to secrete enzymes, proteolytic enzymes that will dissolve that blood. So even if you can suture it, which is difficult to do, although we have these excellent tools that I was talking about and showing you, um, if that clot washes away, it's not going to heal very well. So primary repair, even though people were trying to really do that in the 70s and the 80s. Um, it, it didn't work very well. So um, it, when Carl mentioned that I did my fellowship with Dr. Andrews, I also did my fellowship with Dr. Clancy, and he's one of the originals to develop a reconstruction. So reconstruction is not a repair. It's taking, um, it's making a whole new ligament. So you're taking um, a tendon from somewhere else, whether it's the bone, patellar tendon bone, a piece of the kneecap, a small piece of that, with the patellar tendon, a third of the patellar tendon, and a little piece of bone off the tibia, or a quadriceps tendon, or a hamstring tendon, or you can even use somebody else's tissue that's donated, although I don't like to do that because those tend to stretch out more. But reconstructions were pretty much, and in, in, uh, the, they were the um, standard of care from the 80s all the way up until most recently with this uh, bear implant. Um, and they do a very good job of restoring stability, um, but you're still robbing Peter to pay 
pitfall, so to speak. You're taking some, uh, something from a healthy area of the body and putting it to try to grow back and form uh, a, a new ACL. And I'll get into the reasons why that's not always optimal, although it, you know, it was an amazing uh, accomplishment at the time. So the bare implant itself, the advantages, some of the advantages are that it, it restores the native ACL. So we're not going in there and shaving away the old ACL and putting a new ligament in there and trying to guess exactly where to, to put the two ends of it. The two ends are still there, it's just torn. So we're sewing something in between so that that ACL basically is in the perfect position. So it restores that native ACL. It bridges that gap between the torn ACL. Um, uh, so that implant basically stays in there for eight weeks. And again, it acts like a bridge. It allows the, the ligament cells from one torn side and the other torn side to grow across it to, to heal. Um, and it's indicated for most ACL tears. The most common are kind of in the middle or more toward the femur or the thigh bone, what we call proximal. Um, and the, the, the more distal ones are less likely. Uh, but again, you got to have at least a stump on the uh, one centimeter on the tibia in order to perform this surgery. So if it's pulled right off the tibia, the shin bone, it might not be an indication, but that's the most rare type. So uh, how does this thing uh, allow for uh, healing of the native ACL? Well, if you look at other ligaments that are not inside a joint, so remember the ACL and the PCL are inside the joint and there's fluid in the joint. Well, if you look at the MCL, which is along the, the inner side of the knee, um, the medial side, or even the LCL, or think of an ankle ligament. So you sprain your ankle, those ligaments are outside of the joint. Ligaments connect bone to bone, they provide stability. So this ligament, these ligaments connect the bones together, otherwise the bones would flop all over the place. So when, normally when a ligament tears, um, it's gonna separate a little bit, okay? And then it's gonna bleed. So just like when you bleed anywhere else, like I cut myself shaving, you're gonna form a scab. So you get an internal scab in between those two torn ends. That scab not only um, uh, has platelets in it, which stop the bleeding, but those platelets have growth factors, which the platelets release those growth factors, which stimulate new blood vessels and cells to come in the area to help it heal but it also provides a bridge for the cells that are in the area to grow across. And that includes not just the ligament cells, but the blood vessels and the nerves. And there are special nerves in our ligaments called proprioceptive nerves that allow their position sense nerves. And they allow the brain to know where the joint and the body is in space and they're protective. And so when you do a reconstruction, when we do a reconstruction, you're drilling through where all those nerves and blood vessels are and you're destroying the native nerves and blood vessels. It still revascularizes, but those nerves never come back to normal. So that proprioceptive protective nerve function that your normal um, ACL has, a reconstructed ACL does not have. So how does it do this? This uh, bare uh, implant is a decellularized type 1 bovine collagen implant designed to allow a blood clot to form to enable the ACL to heal. What does all that mean? Well, type 1 collagen, collagen you, people have heard of that in beauty products and all that. It's basically the soft tissue building blocks um, of our body. And type one bovine means bovine means cow. So yes, you will move after this. That's one of the side effects. Not just kidding. But um, it is it is purified collagen from cows. Um, and type one collagen is the type of collagen that is in ligaments and tendons. So it's purified, um, and we it, it kind of acts like a sponge. Um, we inject the patients or put the patient's blood on it and it soaks it up. So it becomes more pliable and basically it becomes like a clot. Okay. And that we sew it in between the two torn ends. Normally, as I said, you do, you would form a clot if you sew it together, but your, the body's going to wash that away or those enzymes are going to dissolve that clot. Well, this bovine uh, collagen takes about eight weeks for the body to dissolve it because you don't want it to stay in there forever either. It's okay. You want it to dissolve, but you want it to stay there long enough so that the two ends heal together. So that takes about eight weeks. So that bare implant basically stays in there for eight weeks, dissolves slowly while your own ligament cells, blood vessels, and nerves grow back across there. Some, some other advantages are, as I said, with the reconstruction, you have to take from a healthy area of the body and put into where the ACL was torn. In this case, you don't have to harvest any healthy tissue. Um, and as I said, it resorbs in around eight weeks. 
So some questions we get um, is like, and one of the most common questions uh, when we talk about ACL reconstruction versus bare, as you know, you know, my doctor said this is new, right? Well, actually wrong. Um, it's been around at least eight years, um, over eight years. And uh, actually the first person who underwent this procedure, his name was, uh, is, is Corey Peak, And it was over eight years ago. And uh, uh, he ran the 2023 uh, Boston Marathon uh, and uh, completed it and did, did very well. Um, and he said, you know, I'm very pleased to share that my bare knee did everything I asked of it. And if you follow him on social media, he's done all kinds of things, rock climbing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been around for over eight years. Um, I also know that Corey ran that marathon in 2023 because my daughter, who's in the center here, ran uh, the Boston Marathon in 2023 as well. So shout out to her. Um, I run seven of them, but I have only run one Boston Marathon. So I was jealous this year when she ran it. Um, what other benefits? Um, again, no graft required. Um, that helps with soreness later on in the rehab pro process and can help uh, decrease um, any pain even years after. So you'll see a video here in a minute. Um, you know, when we take that uh, graft from somewhere else, uh, there's going to be pain in that area. So ACL reconstruction tends to be a little bit more painful than the bear. And also that pain or scarring from where we harvested that, that other tendon graft um, can sometimes lead to pain even years down the road. Um, there's less risk of overall complications with the bear and also um, something called kneeling pain. So if we take a graft from the front of the knee, um, people tend to have pain in, uh, kneeling down for quite some time. Sometimes it can be permanent. Um, because we're not harvesting another tendon, uh, the bear people in the beginning, the rehab's a little slower. Carl will talk to you about that because obviously you want that to heal without pulling apart. But we're not harvesting any tendons or muscles from anywhere. So actually you get your strength back um, faster in the long run and also um, hopefully stronger by the time you get back to your sport. Um, another thing that can happen with ACL reconstructions is it's sometimes tough to get that full straightening or even hyperextension back. And we haven't found that to be a problem. If anything, bending it can be a little bit slower with the uh, bear, but as long as the rehab's done right, we haven't had any issues with range of motion. And if you can't get that knee all the way straight and you walk with a little bit of a bent knee or you don't get that full extension or hyperextension back, those patients tend to have pain in the front of the knee. So quote, anterior knee pain, um, pain in the front of the knee is not an uncommon thing. Uh, with ACL reconstruction, but it's very rare with the bear surgery. Um, and, you know, another advantage, your ACL looks like a normally ACL because it is, it, it's the same, it's the same tissue that's just healed. And so the risk of failure uh, in the studies has found that it's basically no different than a reconstruction. So you get the benefits of st stabilizing the knee. Um, can you re-injure it? Yeah, it's possible you can re-injure a reconstruction or you can injure a bear, but it's about the same uh, rate of failure, and there's a lot more advantages to the bear as far as, um, you know, what the studies show, but also what we have seen in our experience over the last, uh, coming on two years now. Um, and uh, the other advantage, which I think is the holy grail, is that it may possibly limit arthritis 10 to 15 years after surgery. So the studies show that if, if you tear your ACL, you got about a 50% chance of developing arthritis within four to five years. If you tear your ACL and you undergo an ACL reconstruction, you still have a 50% chance of getting arthritis, but it may be 12 to 14 years down the road. That may seem like a long time, but if you're 14 years old, 14 years from that is 28. That's awfully young to be getting arthritis. So in the bear studies, they looked at a group of pigs where they cut their ACL, let them run wild for a year. They had another group of pigs where they cut their ACL, did a reconstruction on that knee, let them run wild for a year. And then they had another group of pigs where they cut their ACL and they did a bear implant and let them run wild for a year. After a year, they harvested all of the pigs and they had a big barbecue, as I like to say. Um, and they looked at the group that the, um, the ACL was cut and they just let them run wild and they all developed arthritis. However, they looked at the group where they cut the ACL and did the ACL reconstruction, and they still developed arthritis, whereas the group that had the ACL cut and had the bare implant didn't develop arthritis. So if that translates into humans, that is 
a humongous reason why the bear is going to be better. Now, I can't officially say because they don't have their, we're keeping track of the results, but as of right now, it's trending toward, it looks like the bear patients have less arthritis than the ACL reconstruction patients, but that study will come out at some point in time. Um, interestingly, people always ask me, you know, hey, I had my ACL reconstructed, what's my chance of re-tearing it? And I always tell them, hey, you have actually, interestingly, just as much chance of tearing your opposite knee as you do the one that we reconstructed. And no one really knows 100% why that is. Some people think it's because those proprioceptive protected nerve fibers don't ever come back to normal in the reconstructed knee. And that puts more stress on the non-reconstructed knee. Also, some people are just a little bit more prone to tearing their ACL based on their anatomy and other things. But we don't really know why that is 100%. Well, what the studies found was that, yes, if you get a bare implant, sure, you can tear your opposite knee, but it's actually a lot less likely to tear the opposite knee than it is in the patients who had the ACL reconstruction. So it protects that opposite knee. And one of the theories is that it's because the normal protective nerves are preserved in the bare implant with the bare implant knee, and that um, uh, lessens the reliance on the opposite knee. Again, we don't 100% know why, but we just do know that that is the results. And if you look at the research, you know, the time to return back to sport and activity, and Carl will get into this as well, um, is either the same or even a little bit better with the bear. So uh, it doesn't take longer. It may take even a little bit less. It's still a long process, no matter what, nine to 12 months, um, but it doesn't take longer for the bear. And this is an example of a patient who had an ACL reconstruction, I believe, seven years earlier on one side and then had the bear implant performed by us. And she's talking about the residual symptoms from the ACL reconstructed knee. Yeah, I don't have any of the anterior knee pain to like, you know, get on my hands and knees and do different activities where I did with the patella. Like I still do seven years later with my patella. Um, it has to be a really soft surface for me to do that. So even seven years later, she was still having that that kneeling pain or that anterior knee pain. Um, I just got one more slide here. You know, patients want to know, you know, what's this, what's it going to look like, incisions, all that stuff. So this is a patient, what, a week out? Uh, I believe she's a week a little over. So um, it requires um, uh, some portal sites, a little small area where I can look in with the arthroscope, as you can see from the video. This is a very small incision, much smaller than what we were doing in the beginning because we, we now drill from outside in, and that just has to be big enough to put that little endo button here. Same thing here, two small incisions where that, that those sutures are going to come across here. And then this just needs to be big enough, this incision, in order for me to push that implant into the knee. I think at some point we'll get to the point where we'll be able to um, hydrate it, compress it, deliver it in arthroscopically. Um, but this is either smaller or, pr or pretty much equal to what you would see uh, with an ACL reconstruction. Um, those incisions are fairly small. And usually, unless there's a lot of swelling, we will use uh, dissolvable stitches. Um, so that ends my part of the talk. And I'm going to hand it over to Carl on the rehab. Thanks, Doc. Uh, so a lot of the questions we get, um, one of which are, you know, my doctor said that the rehab um, is different and it takes longer to get back. Why? Um, I guess it kind of goes back to when is the right time. So when I first started, we were trying to get back people, you know, as soon as possible. The pendulum tends to swing one way or the other. If you look at kind of the more recent research, that nine to 12 month is kind of that sweet spot anyway. So if you're actually basing your reconstruction rehab and your protocols on what the research suggests, it's right in the wheelhouse, maybe a skosh uh, slower, maybe a skosh, skosh faster. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, uh, I just read an article that they um, studied protocols from 46 different surgeons and the amount of variability in the reconstruction group was like vast and, and, and all over the place. So uh, it, it's, it's not like that with the bear. There's a standardized guidelines that they, they recommend, which to my knowledge, there's not really any other product out there that has the same guidelines, which is nice. So we're all doing the same standard of care. 
the big thing is you kind of have to let biology do what biology does. Um, so the ACL reconstruction, like I alluded to, is time and criteria based. You have to be X amount of time out and be able to do X, Y, and Z in order to do, you know, A, B, C. Guess what? The Bayer rehab is the exact same. It should be time and criteria based, right? I think early on, we have to respect time quite a bit more than we would with the ACL reconstruction. I'll dive into that a little bit more. Um, but generally speaking, most of our bear patients feel really, really good. Like three, four days after surgery, they're in quite a bit of pain for the first few days. And then after that, like their resting pain is zero. They might be, and I'll, I'll show the slide, but it's like a three and a half out of 10 uh, at worst pain that they're experiencing, which is not what you'd expect with ACL reconstruction. So I guess, why is the rehab different, right? So this is that pig study that Doc was alluding to. Um, I had the pulled pork that day. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> if you look at the time point from zero weeks to three months, so if, um, these dotted lines are cellularity and vascularity. So you can see in the first six weeks, there's a tremendous amount of healing. The body's trying to bring a lot of properties in order to literally repair itself, um, which before this... Um, little marshmallow wasn't possible. And you can also see they're almost inversely related, the yield load on these uh, pigs, right? So you can notice it actually does get a little weaker. It starts out and then all of a sudden it kind of shoots up. So guess what? Right around the time where we start to do stuff is right around the eight week mark or set, per se. And we do some things before then that we know are little to no stress on that ACL. So this is in pigs. Um, obviously, I don't think anyone's going to sign up for the study to see, see what the yield load of their bear was, although I'm sure some people are testing it um, and not being compliant with recommendations, um, and we've had a few of those. Um, this is different than a, than a traditional ACL graft. Actually, when you have like a patella or quad tendon uh, graft with a traditional reconstruction, the graft strength is actually quite a bit higher than the actual uh, strength of the ACL. So that's where some of the inherent variability you'll see in, in, in protocols will come from the reconstruction group is brace, gait training, all that stuff early on. And there's an inherent variability. But what we do know is as time goes on, that graft has to get weaker before it gets stronger. Well, why? Well, it's taking tissue that's alive, generally speaking, if, if they're taking a piece of your tissue, they're not taking you know a cadaver tissue. Um, and your body has to go through the healing process of bringing blood to the area, bringing, bringing nerve supply to the area. So that takes time. So you actually have to, it has to deaden before it kind of has regrowth. Yeah, it was alive. And then you take it from an area and now it's dead. So it's going to, it's got to. Right. So that six to 12 week again. mark with the reconstruction group, that's kind of that uh, spot where we're going to generally see a lot of our failures, um, especially if the protocol and the program that, that the patient's on is not uh, appropriate or, you know, it's too much stress on the graft. So I, one of the questions we get is, how do I know if I'm a candidate? Um, I've done the research. It seems great, right? I don't have all the pain, and it seems to be at least the same, probably better as far as my return to sport, return to activity. Um, well, we know this. Stump size matters. Um, that's probably the biggest reason um, for someone to uh, not be able to have uh, this procedure done, would you say? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if there's no stump on the tibia, then it's uh, then yeah, you're not a candidate. And uh, usually, about ninety percent, I believe, is what they they uh, um, feel is has the the adequate stump size, just based on how ACLs typically are torn. They're torn typically more of a mid substance tear. So the length of the time of injury, um, you know, with the FDA guidelines, you have to be 50 days out from injury. Um, I think Doc would, would kind of agree with this. We're kind of seeing that maybe that's not as much of a big deal as so much as the quality of the tissue. Um, and Doc's done, to this point, she, the furthest one out was, up, I think, 11 months or so. Um, and she's doing fine. MRIs look good, et cetera. Um, so like I said, you know, it's cleared for the first 50 days after, after injury, but Doc's done this procedure on people well, well further out than that. Yeah, I mean, it just matters if there's still enough stump there and it's because it, it doesn't always tear 100 percent or it might scar down to the PCL and there might still be a blood supply too, and it might still be good. But um, the studies in the studies, uh, they didn't do anybody uh, over 50 days. Right. I think even 45 was one of them, but the FDA has cleared it for 50 days. So technically it's uh, it would be off label, but we do. There's lots of things that we do off label. Um, in, in medicine, as long as it's uh, related. Um, so 
And that goes for age too. Um, I think it has to be 14 or older. That's correct. So one of the things, um, Doc has a perfect track record, by the way, as of this webinar. Um, so if for whatever reason, you know, the MRI, it, it's shown he feels like there's a, a large enough stump and he gets in there and all of a sudden, like, they're not a candidate, you're not a candidate. Well, what happens, right? So uh, he's, Doc is totally prepared um, to perform a traditional reconstruction, uh, generally does a quad tendon uh, uh, reconstruction. Um so he's preparing for that, but to date we haven't had anyone that's actually had to do that that wasn't a candidate that he's determined going up to that was uh, a candidate for the bear procedure. You know, we hear other things like, hey, I'm over 50. I heard, uh, you know, healing's hard as we age. Yeah, that might be true. We probably have some solutions that we've worked out as well. Um, you know, I talked about this already. You know, my happen my injury happened well over 50 days ago. Now what? Um, you're still a candidate most often. You know, we may augment with some other uh other things that we offer here besides just the bare procedure. Um victory sports medicine sounds amazing, but we're not local. What what can we do to help? Well, you know, we've done you know, rehab and docs done surgery on people. They've come from Belgium, as far as Belgium, to have it done at this point. Um, and then remotely, we monitor them with telemedicine visits with Dr. Petra Pali, with our with our um, our bear staff uh, that that specializes in rehabbing uh, these patients. Um, and then we kind of can get you set up with a, an online remote training program as well. So so distance isn't the issue. Um, more often than not, we're in you know good contact with the, the your treating physio or therapist in that area. So you know they're in constant communication with us. So we know that you're kind of falling in line and, and 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 progressing as appropriately. Yeah, I mean we have multiple patients from Canada. South Dakota, North Dakota, um, Pennsylvania, Virginia, so um, Florida, yeah. Florida. So, like Carl said, the one of the advantages of uh, telemedicine that came out of COVID is we're really good at it, and they're really good at it, um, doing the rehab with it, and also communicating, like he said, really communicating with the your own therapist from wherever you're from. Other things is like, how do I know it'll work? Based on the research, we know that you know the failure rate is is just as good as a traditional reconstruction. Uh, I would say you will certainly stack the odds in your favor if you're compliant with the guidelines and recommendations uh, after surgery. So if you want it to work, follow the rules. Um, and and uh, we haven't had anyone that's followed the rules um, not have um, a good adequate healing uh, ACL. At that goes point. for any surgery. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, when can I start to do uh, things of function like in day-to-day -day life? Um, I mean, that depends. Generally speaking, we're restrictive with the gait training or the walking and the, and, and the range of motion early on. You can start doing upper body stuff soon afterwards. Uh, anything strenuous, lower body, um, you know, usually walking is between the four and the eight week mark. And then more strenuous lifting, we usually start right around the three month mark or so. Um so, and I already talked about this, you know, what happens if the bare procedure is not allowed to be performed? Well, we have a traditional reconstruction ready to go if needed. Like I said, Doc has a perfect record thus far, not to jinx him by any means. Um, and then, you know, big things, what should I expect after surgery, right? Um, these are all things that we would typically do. Um, you're going to be required to be in a T-scope brace, which is just a long brace that kind of locks your knee straight. Um, that's anywhere from six to eight weeks, um, after surgery, depending if there's meniscus involvement where they have to, doc has to repair it. Um, we can start with some gait training, um, in clinic at the one month mark, um, as long as there's not a meniscus repair involved. And then we're restricting, uh, the range of motion for the first six weeks. Um, but the good news is, um, typically the day of surgery, you can put about 50% of your weight right through that limb and that leg. Um, typically, um, the pain is going to be much less compared to a traditional reconstruction. Um, early on, the protocol is quite a bit more conservative than a traditional reconstruction because you're literally regrowing your own ACL. Um, big things, big question. Everyone asks, when can I sleep without that brace? Uh, six weeks uh, is the mark that we allow you to sleep without that brace. Hey, just regarding the pain there, um, if you've never had a surgery before, you're going to have pain. But as you saw, uh, that woman uh, uh, that we had the video on earlier, 
she said it was quite a bit less painful than her ACL reconstruction. So if you had an ACL reconstruction before, you might notice a difference, um, but it is technically less painful, although any surgery still has pain for sure. And we, we treat that with pain medication and you can do it. The anesthesiologist can do a block and things like that. So once you get to that 110 degrees uh, knee flexion, uh, we put you in that functional brace. Uh, you saw Izzy in, in a bunch of slides ago. Um, and then you're in that for day-to-day -day stuff until about the three month mark. And then once you demonstrate proficiency in test, then we slowly start to take the brace away. Um, but you will be in sport with it for one full year. Um, so this kind of alludes to our, our, our pain levels. You know, day after surgery, we all we see all of our uh, post-op patients. Generally, people are in quite a bit of pain. Like I said, they usually rate it, you know, eight and a half out of ten. But the great thing is, there's this really quick trend. Usually, it's around day three, day four. It's almost like a, a, a switch hits, and they're like, "Yeah, the pain's not there anymore." Um, and this is pain at worst, for the record. So, by two weeks, the worst pain is a three point five out of ten, um, which is quite amazing to me. Um, and then it stays that way. Um, and you can see it continues to trend downward. Uh, big thing with this big uh, hot topic of conversation is what happens if my knee gets stiff? Um, well, guess what? I took or we took the first 25 bears that Doc has done. And when the um, range of motion was a bit more restrictive um, and we looked at their range of motion at specific data points. And you can see that, you know, at the six week mark, we like to see at least a 90. Most people are about 76.3. So people are quote unquote behind, but there is some inherent variability. And then watch what happens. At the 12 week mark, they start to catch up. Six months, nine months, there's no issue, right? So in that six to 12 week point is when you start to notice some more gains. We can be a little bit more aggressive with our hands-on therapy as well. Um, the other part that we alluded to was the early rehab differences in the range of motion, right? Which may make people a little nervous about uh, getting stiff. Traditional reconstruction, you're going to get your knee as straight and as bent as much as you can tolerate early on. With the bear, you're going to be locked in with it straight. We're not going to force it into extension. Past extension may put a little bit of strain on that um, um, bear repair site. Uh, for the first two weeks, we're going to limit you to about 40 degrees or about that much bend, so not a whole lot. And then after that, we start to get a little bit more aggressive with the range of motion. And MIAC does recommend that you only do active knee flexion only. Um, so the other piece is the early difference in the weight bearing. With the bear and the ACL, with the bear, you're locked in a, in a, in a T-scope for at least four weeks if there was no meniscus repair uh, if there's a meniscus repair, it's at least six, which puts the ACL and the bear kind of right on par with each other. So with the reconstruction, uh, the brace may be only locked for two weeks. Um, bear, you're going to have about half your weight bearing uh, for the first four weeks. Um, and then at, with the reconstruction of the two weeks mark, you're going to unlock it. And you're actually going to start gate training. Um, whereas with the bear, you're going to start to gate training generally at the week four to six uh, point. Um, with the reconstruction, you get rid of the brace and the crutches much sooner. Um, but with the bear, because your body is literally regrowing its own tissue, uh, that's not until at least the six week mark that you're generally getting rid of, uh, the crutches for walking. And you're going to be more weight bearing as tolerated with ACL reconstruction versus earlier with the bear. We're going to limit your uh, weight bearing about 50%. Um, with, with the reconstruction group, you're going to start earlier, close kinetic chain exercises though with the bear, which is squats and that and step ups and that kind of stuff. Um, I, I guess the, the big question a lot of people right now are asking is why can't I walk with a brace unlocked sooner? Well, believe it or not, there's a tremendous amount of stress on your ACL when you walk. It's like nine to 13 percent, depending on the literature you look at, of, of peak strain on the ACL. So there's more stress on your ACL walking than squatting. Um, as long as you're squatting properly, I should say. Um, so how, how are you going to walk the day after surgery, right? If you, you break, if you can be locked in extension with crutches, well, uh, we have our guy here who is literally the day after surgery. Oh, maybe there he goes. Let's try that one more time. There you go. All right. Henry is now one day. Post bear. 
starting his gate trading. Two crutches. How you doing, my man? All right. He's okay. He's he's hanging in there. I'll have you turn around. Same thing, pointing that toe straight forward. I'm going to get kind of a behind shot here. Beautiful. Nice and upright for me, buddy. Proud chest, proud chest. There you go. Beautiful. All right, that was Zach uh, coaching along the way. Zach also has a very proud chest. Mm -hmm. Never missed a chest day in his life. Um, the other question would be, that sounds great, but why not be back doing what I love, right? So um, I guess if we can break it down into the phases of rehab at this point. Phase one is that maximum protection phase, phase which is zero to four weeks. Uh, phase two is kind of that gait training or kind of reestablishing your your weight and your through the through your leg when your four, your leg is on the ground, and that's generally weeks four to eight. Uh, phase three is where we do more controlled loading. This is kind of getting you back to appreciate maybe some more higher level squatting, uh, deadlifting, step ups, that kind of activities. Um, and that's generally weeks eight to 12. Um, you know, it, it's, it's your ACL is kind of intact, but it's not fully remodeled yet. So we have to really monitor how much strain we're imparting on those tissues. Phase four is we're kind of increasing your load intolerance, load tolerance. So we're kind of, um, taking what we learned from weeks eight to 12 and we're kind of kicking it up a notch per se. And that's generally between the 12 weeks and the four and a half month phase, um, and then the phase, the phase five, which is the real fun phase is kind of development of power, strength, endurance. This may be plyometrics, running, um, higher level kind of things, transition you back to the sport that you enjoy to do. And that's generally the four and a half to seven and a half, half month range, which kind of gets us to the more of that sport specific where we're kind of conditioning you to exactly what you need to be doing. Uh, you know, it's going to look like if you're a hockey player, you're doing exercises and, and activities a hockey player should be doing. If you're a soccer player, you're going to be doing exercises and activities and drills that a soccer player should be doing with modifications and taking away those constraints as time goes on. So um, this is a young lady who was at the point about two weeks out of uh, bare procedure. Um, so in the maximum protection phase, once the incisions are healed, we can start doing blood flow restriction training or BFR. Um, we want to make sure uh, they can tolerate that and there's not going to be a, a chance for um, any drainage out of those incisions. So this is a really great way to kind of slow down the atrophy that normally happens with, with these types of procedures. Um, you only need about 30, 40% of the load in order to get the benefits that you would with a traditional strength training at like 80, 85% load. So, um, doing simple things like quad sets or squeezing your thigh or lifting your leg up in the air, um, become much more strenuous with those cuffs on. Um, you know, this is just demonstrating a quad set. Uh, she's going to be pushing her knee into the towel there. We don't recommend that you hang out with a towel behind your knee straight leg raise where you're going to kind of squeeze your thigh and you're going to lift your leg up as well as uh, some patellar mobilizations over here. Super, super important because the range of motion is restricted. Uh, learning how to do this properly and having a therapist that's making a concerted effort to do this by far the individuals that get stiff are the ones that don't have this done properly, not doing enough, or if it gets glanced over by the treating therapist. Um, and then basic range of motion exercise, you can do like a heel slide on the on the wall. I generally will put you in a brace and that way we're locking you to a certain point so you're not flexing past the allowable range based on where you're at. Uh, week two, you'll do like what's called like a long arc quad. You can do it with assistance. So, you know, you can start to bend it and then you can start assist bending and then you can actively straighten your leg with some assistance to the back leg. You can do some glute work getting your kind of rear end involved here. And then, you know, we like to do the hamstring curls. This helps get your hamstrings activated. And once again, this would be to an allowable range of motion. Uh, so gait training, um, you know, that's about that six weeks mark for this gentleman here. He also had a huge bucket handle tear. Uh, he underwent bone marrow aspirate and PRP injections as well to help, kind of really help augment his healing. 
So this is him at like six weeks, kind of learning how to walk again. Okay. That was Elvin. Yeah, Elvin and Chipmunks for sure. Looks good there. Yeah, it's bizarre. We didn't know we did it. Yeah. <laughs> we got a walker. <laughs> so that was Lucci. That was his first week with us. Uh, good, good sport with it all. Um, Really, really good uh, PTA with us. Uh, we actually hired him after his internship, so he's with us currently. Um, so thankful for him being a good sport. Um, at this phase, we're going to start doing some wall squats. You might be doing like a leg extension with um, some resistance band. So she would be pushing into that, straighten your leg out, backwards walking, really, really good to kind of get that quad activated and getting that leg nice and straight. Um, Quad sets in standing, single leg balance, and core work. Core work is super important if you have a traditional reconstruction of this bear, often underappreciated uh, portion of the rehab process, in my opinion. Phase three, co controlled loading, uh, goblet squats, modified single leg squats up here, deadlifting, single leg deadlifting, and obviously we're building this based on what your abilities are, right? So that he may have to start with his foot on the ground to get a little bit of stability, band walks, getting the glutes going, um, step downs, balance work, um, you know, anything to get that quad going in a single leg manner, uh, as well as balance at this phase is, is really important. So phase four is kind of reestablishing that load tolerance. Um, this is kind of getting back to higher level of what you were doing the phase before, um, a little bit more um, in line with traditional strength and conditioning principles. Um, so, you know, this is Katie. She's doing leg press, single leg here. She's probably got 75% of her body weight there. She's doing, you know, single leg deadlift with a little bit of perturbation training in there. Um, to make sure that she's got really good control. Um, and if you can't tell, Katie's a beast. Um, and here's some rebounder work, working on balance, getting that quad firing in a static position. And then she's getting some uh, perturbation by that ball coming back to her. So she has to maintain, maintain her balance on this uneven surface. So not as easy as she made that look by any means. Um, you may be saying to yourself, cool, I like to run, uh, but when can I run? Um, so at the 18 point, 18 week is the minimum before we let our patients run. Uh, we do a Y balance test and you have to be at least 85% of the unaffected leg. Uh, it will do a three by 15 of single leg squats with good form, same with a single leg calf raise, um, and then demonstrate the ability to kind of appreciate that compressive force. So we do exercises to appreciate um, so the joint can appreciate that compressive force as you run, because there's a tremendous amount of stress uh, four to six times your body weight when you're running that goes through that limb. So we want to make sure you can tolerate it before we let you do it. And then from a strength perspective, to know that you can you can tolerate that, we're looking for about 1.25% 1 of your body mass with the single leg press that you saw Katie doing um, in the slides before here. And then snap down without shifts, so you're controlling equally through both limbs. Um, so phase five, right? So this is the fun phase. This is this is Cully. Cully's a uh, high school hockey player. Um, and these are kind of the, some of the things that you'll see our athletes doing or individual doing. So he's working on getting up high, getting up strong, and then driving down with that ball. Um, this is something you would probably not enjoy doing if you had a traditional reconstruction. He's doing sliders, working on some adductor strength here. Um, adductor strains are very common in hockey players Stay so tall. straining that to that prevent Stay you tall. from having an adductor strain when you get there back you seems go. to be Stay obviously tall. important good and then last but not least he's going to do a box jump death jump into a box jump into some med ball slam so
So this is where our athletes or individuals can start to get a little bit more violent with uh, with their training. Um, and it's fun. Um, so at the week 20 to 24 mark, you know, we're looking, we're basing everything on strength and conditioning. Um, you know, we're not going to get too deep into the weeds here, but it's, it's gradual progression over force is kind of what you should see here. And, and activities and plyometrics increase as um, your tissues allowed. Um, and this is just a general recommendation for ply plyometric training after reconstruction. Um, you're just slowly, methodically building over time. And then phase um, six, these are more of that sport specific training. Um, and Cully came back one more time to rip some slappies here. And I think he was about eight months or so when that video was taken. Big thing is the end stage is the same, right? They have to pass tests in order to, to, to play, right? Um, there is no clear cut answer on what are the best tests. We know, you know, quad strength is a huge one. Thigh cir cir circumference is something we look at. Look at. You know, we, we compare side by side, 30 seconds, single leg squat test, 30 second step down test, hop for single leg hop for distance, triple hop for distance, six meter hop test, crossover hop, vertical hop test. And uh, there's a whole bunch of, you know, psychological readiness tests that you can perform. The easiest one is literally looking at the individual say, if I told you you could go out and com compete today, would you think about your knee? If there's hesitancy at all, the answer is no. Even if they tell you yes, they probably need more time. I, there's a tremendous amount of value in that question. Um, I think that everyone should be asked it. And uh, this is Tyler. Um, he is completing some of that testing I, I talked about. Um, and this is what your knee can potentially look like at uh, the nine month mark, I think is where he was at. So, A, I didn't, I've never seen a high school athlete almost jump out of our clinic area. B, uh, it was probably a music choice because ACDC actually has helped uh, with force development. I think the research shows 10 to 12% increase in force development if you listen to uh, ACDC. Actually, there's a study that shows that um, it act, it helps uh, with efficiency in the OR as well, believe it or not. I believe it. ACDC specifically. Yeah. I'm assuming that was a, a case study by Dr. Petrobelli. No, it's legit. It's a real <laughs> study. It's a real study. It's a real study. Speaking of case studies. Um, might be from Australia. That would be biased. But, uh, we had, that's where they're from. We had our 58-year-old female. She had a skiing accident in Vermont. Felt her knee pop. Uh, she was seen by an orthopedic surgeon, recommended to have an MRI, <clears throat> and it, which revealed an ACL rupture. Uh, she did uh, tip, uh, traditional PT and decided to treat it conservatively. She continued to have persistent symptoms, and then she scheduled an appointment with us. Um, we did the updated imaging, um, and she elected to go to undergo the bare procedure. Uh, she also had medial and lateral meniscus repairs, as well as tricompartmental chondroplasty. So Doc cleaned up all portions of the joint as well. Um, she actually also elected to undergo the bone marrow aspirate concentrate and PRP injection. There's a P in PRP, just so you know, uh, in order to augment her healing. Um, at three months, uh, she reported that she was about 80% improvement. Um, and then she did confide in us that the week before she was in Vegas dancing, um, but her knee felt great. Well, she also said she had her brace on. She also was 11 months out from the surgery because she had like two trips of a lifetime planned already paid for. So she, she could just not have, she could not have the surgery. So because of her age, although she appears younger than stated age for sure. Um, and because of the time frame out uh, that we elected to augment this biologically with the bone marrow um, aspirate cells and the PRP, the platelet rich plasma. There's her ACL. So at, the at Three months too, I believe that was. Yep, yep, exactly. So I have a few more, so you can pretty crazy. You. Yeah, I mean the tear was mid substance, and you can see this the the black ligament. But this is three months out, and this is the the bare implant. So a normal ligament's going to look black, um, but uh, a healing ligament's going to have some white and gray in it. And so this is where the implant was, and this is all healing, but it's reattaching itself at three months. That's just amazing. I think it's the, a credit to the implant and it's a credit to her, uh, 
rehab specialists, uh, but it's also a credit to the PR. Uh, thanks for bearing with us. Um, no pun intended. Uh, all right, we have a list of questions that Lori has given us from the chat. Um, Doc, this one looks like it's probably going to be right up your alley. Um, it's about the bone marrow uh, BMAC and the PRP injection. Um, they want to know um, how that's performed and if that's done the same day as the surgery or not. Um, so our bone marrow has uh, cells in it, including stem cells and other cells that help the stem cells, not actually stem cell injections. We're not taking your cells, sending them off to a lab, growing them, culturing them, mailing them back and injecting them. And that's not allowed in the U.S., but we are allowed to uh, take um, bone marrow cells with a special uh, needle that concentrates the cells. And we're able to use those cells um, to in inject into different areas. So um, technically it's FDA approved for handling of uh, bone grafts, but this is technically an off-label use of either PRP or bone marrow, but we are able to um, use it um, in situations such as the knee. So um, PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. That is usually the blood is taken from the, uh, like an arm uh, and it's spun down in a centrifuge. And we have red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, antibodies, proteins, fluid, all kinds of different things in our blood. The platelets, as I said earlier, are those things that when you cut yourself, uh, they form a scab and they stop the bleeding, but they also have growth factors. So they release those growth factors and those growth factors stimulate new blood vessels and cells to come in the area. So it's kind of like fertilizer where the cells actually do the work. That's kind of like grass seed. I like to use that analogy, but um, you can do it at the time of surgery. And I have, um, it just depends on the facility where I'm operating at and what equipment they have, et cetera. So a lot of times I'll do the surgery and then uh, we'll let you guys get the swelling down uh, and uh, and the inflammation down after the first couple of weeks. Like Carl said, within a few days, that starts to go down with the bear. So usually around two weeks, I can do that procedure in the office. We harvest um, the bone marrow from the pelvis, not, not the back, not the spine, not the hip. People like to say hip. Um, it's called the posterior superior iliac spine. If anybody wants to look that up. Um, and it's just to numb it up. It can be done in the office. There's no anesthesia, just local anesthetic. Um, and like I said, the blood is drawn either from the arm or you can even draw the blood actually from the, the bone marrow at the same time. Uh, and that then is injected into the knee uh, in the area where we want it to go. If that makes any sense. Perfect sense. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily change the protocol of the rehab afterwards. Um, you know, we, we may notice as time goes on, we may change that a little bit um, for the better for the patients. But <clears throat> for right now, we're not trying to change too much too soon, just so everyone's aware. Um, I'll tackle this one. Um, it looks like they're asking <clears throat> about the testing and when it's performed. Um, so time and criteria, like I mentioned. So generally speaking, the return to sports stuff, we're not really testing um, and looking for you to pass until the nine month mark and a minimum, you will be doing activities that mimic um, some of the testing well before. And it's a, a stepwise progression to get there. Um, right, that person looked to schedule an appointment. It looks like Lori already gave them our email, but well, I guess if anyone out there, um, if you do want to make an appointment and need more information, um, you could always call the office. It may actually be uh, easier if you actually email us though. Uh, email us at actually at bear at victory sports medicine.com. Um, that'll go to our bear specialist that will be able to give you a call or set up a time for a consult or uh, a, a session of education by Dr. Petropoli. Um, what about well. the single leg um, squat or something? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there it is. So, yep, I guess that was the second part of that question. I missed that. Sorry. Um, yeah, so single leg squatting. Um, Must be a PT who answered who sent Scott, this in. I would I would assume it's probably a PT. Maybe it's one of maybe one of ours messing with. Probably. Um, so double limb first, be able to demonstrate good balance, and then modified. So like a step standing uh, squat, and then doing it against the wall, then taking out the the wall. So that's somewhere around the eight to 12 week mark before you're doing that. And then the depth changes as time goes on. 
All right. Um, it looks like we're just about out of time. Um, so if you do have any questions, you can email us bear at victory um, and we'd be happy to hear from you or set up a, a consult um, or uh, an appointment. Thank you all. Thank Carl for putting this together and uh, Lori for getting the questions and the music. Thanks, Thank Lori. You. Great music.